All right, brothers and sisters, we're going to pick back up with the Desert Experience series. This is part two. And to quickly recap what was covered in part one, we looked at what is a desert experience. And especially when we contrast that, a desert experience, a desert scenario, with a mountaintop experience, like the one that Moses experienced, or when Jesus brought the disciples, Peter, James, and John, to the mountaintop. And they had a wonderful and glorious experience and the mountaintop. And when Moses, when he came down from the mountaintop, after communing and speaking with God, his face shone. And brothers and sisters, the mountaintop experience is going to be the pinnacle of the human experience with God. But when we get to a desert experience or a valley experience, that is going to be the total opposite. It's going to be a scenario. It's going to be an experience where everything seems to be going wrong in the earth or in our lives. And the examples that we looked at in part one were the life of Abraham. When he entered into the land that the Lord was giving to him in Genesis chapter 12. And soon after he arrived, there was a severe famine that came across the land. And we also see a similar experience with Isaac. When he was going off on his own, married, there is a famine that came across the land. And in these situations, the dry places, the desert, the valley, when things seem to be falling apart in our lives or in our family members' lives or in our workplace or employment situation, in our businesses or in our communities, a desert experience, as David called it in the 23rd Psalm, going through the valley of the shadow of death. And as Christians living in this current world, when we become born again, full of the Holy Spirit, we will definitely experience these adverse situations. We will have to go through a valley, a low point, a difficult place, a desert. Things are going to seem to go wrong. Or to put it a better way, Things are going to be adverse or contrary to our hopeful expectations as a Christian or a child of God. A typical Christian fairly new to the faith or even a Christian who has been walking in their faith or at least claiming to walk in their faith for a little while he or she will generally have an optimistic viewpoint on the things that God will allow in their life. In other words, brothers and sisters, as Christians, we think that everything is going to go smoothly in our lives when we become a Christian. And brothers and sisters, that is simply not the case. That is not how God runs this world or this universe, and that is not how God will direct and guide our lives in this world. We will most definitely have a desert-like experience, and oftentimes more than one, like Abraham. When he gets to the place that God had called him, and soon after that, a severe famine came over the region. And while a famine coming over the region is a human experience and a human description of what's happening in the earth and in our surroundings, it is not necessarily the same phenomenon to our God. And that's a lesson we should learn about being a Christian and going through a desert situation 
or going through that valley of the shadow of death as David describes it. What Abraham overlooked when the famine came to the region, the place to where God had called him to, and while we can all look around at what's happening in the world around us, be it a famine in the land, a rogue or corrupt government, or society, or godless culture operating with a reckless abandon in our communities and in our neighborhoods, while we can be troubled by these things that are happening around us, we must never forget as a Christian that we are children of the living God. And what may be a famine to us, our human experience, that desert experience or situation to our human understanding and sensibilities, that same situation to our God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is not necessarily something that's negative. For God, it is an easy thing to overcome. And what we witnessed, what the scriptures reported in the life of Isaac, Abraham's son, when a similar famine came across the region, and God told Isaac to not go down into Egypt, but to stay in the place where he had been called, Stay in your land, the land that I had called you to. And then God told Isaac that I am going to be with you in the midst of whatever is happening in the land. And furthermore, God said to Isaac, and I will bless you in the middle of this famine. So while Abraham using his human wisdom decided to run from the famine to the nation of Egypt, to a world system, a godless world system, to seek help and safety in his time of need, we see that Isaac, who was told directly by God to stay in your land, Isaac was provided for and blessed. He was saved in the middle of a famine occurring in the earth. Now the lives of these two men have been recorded in scripture and they give us a better view of what our God can do. And if God is with us as Christians and born again believers, then we should begin to change our perspective on the situations that happen in this world. We can no longer look at the situations that happen around us according to our human reasoning and worldly wisdom. Isaac was of the same mindset of his father, Abraham. When things began to go bad in the land, when a famine was coming across the region, Isaac was thinking to himself that I will go down to Egypt. I will seek provision and safety in a world system. And brothers and sisters, we all tend to think that way because we are products of this world system. We were born in this world system. We were raised in the culture and the ways of the world around us. So it is natural for us to put two and two together and reason to ourselves that going down to Egypt, going to a world system, going to the efforts of humankind for our safety and provision is the best course of action when things go wrong. But before Isaac could pack up and make up his mind to fully go down to Egypt to escape the famine, the word of the Lord came to him in Genesis chapter 26, telling him to stay in his land. Stay where I called you. That's what God said. And we too, brothers and sisters, must always seek the counsel of God when things around us begin to go bad. We have to diligently seek what is the will of the Lord for our lives in this current situation. 
because while it is a desert or a dangerous or disastrous situation to our human sensibilities, to our God, this is just another worldly challenge that our divine and all powerful heavenly father can easily overcome on our behalf. So brothers and sisters, if a desert situation, a dangerous or adverse scenario comes to us, knocks on the doors of our lives, that situation is not a dangerous or turbulent or disastrous situation to our God. And if it is not dangerous or disastrous or something that our God cannot overcome on our behalf, then why should we in our minds and hearts look at these worldly situations any differently than the way our God looks at them? Isaac learned that lesson during the famine and most definitely after the famine had passed because God was blessing him in the midst of the famine. He grew to be a wealthy and powerful man. And at the end of the famine, I'm sure that Isaac was saying, in hindsight, what famine? What storm or what disaster? Because he was blessed in the midst of the famine. And Isaac probably said to himself, what did I really think that I was going to experience when my God was right there with me? And brothers and sisters, that is the power of God, the providence of God that works in our lives, changing not only the situations that we find ourselves dealing with in this world, but it should also begin to change our minds. It should change how we think about the scenarios and situations that we will encounter in this world. Now, the people around Isaac, the non-believers, they were experiencing trouble. They were experiencing a famine. But Isaac was resting and at peace because he was being blessed and provided for in a divine manner by the true and living God. Now, brothers and sisters, let's begin to explore some other aspects of what is being revealed in a desert situation or a desert experience. And as we begin to look at the journey of the nation of Israel out of Egypt in the Exodus, out of the slavery and bondage to Egypt, to a godless world system, when they were divinely saved from that situation in Egypt, that oppression, and they were on their journey to the promised land in a covenant relationship with their God. But before we get to their journey, let's quickly look at how they arrived in Egypt. And to do that, brothers and sisters, we have to look at Jacob's entry into Egypt in Genesis chapter 46. Joseph was already sold into slavery by his family, his brothers. That's how Joseph entered into Egypt as a slave. And eventually Joseph rose to be prime minister of Egypt, second in command only to Pharaoh. And then a famine came over the region. And when we get to Genesis chapter 46, Joseph now reveals himself to his brothers as they had went down to Egypt to get grain. And now Joseph invites his family to come and live in Egypt. We should start to see a pattern. It was a famine in the land at that time also, brothers and sisters. And the patriarch of that family, Jacob, has a decision to make. Does he stay in the land that was given to him by his family, the land that God had given to Abraham and Isaac? 
or does he go down to Egypt during this period of a famine over the land and the region? So what we read in Genesis chapter 46, it says, and God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. So here we see, brothers and sisters, the will of God for the family of Jacob who is now called Israel. And Jacob, that family, will now be made into a nation when they leave the land of Egypt. And Jacob, the leader of the family, with his 12 sons, they get the blessing of the Lord to go down into Egypt. In verse 4, it says, I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I will eventually bring you out. In this instance, brothers and sisters, we see that it is God's will and purpose for the family of Israel to go down into Egypt during this period of a famine in the land. Now, as it concerns Abraham, scriptures does not record that he inquired of the Lord concerning his decision to go down into Egypt when a famine came across the land. And in Isaac's situation, it was the Lord who revealed to him that it was not his will for Isaac to go down into Egypt when there was a famine in the land. So here we get to Jacob. And we see that it is God's will for Jacob and his family to go down into Egypt. The Lord was going to go with them and they will be made into a great nation in that land of Egypt, in the world system. And eventually, God didn't stop there. He said, eventually, the nation that you will grow into will come out of that land. And that's where we get into the Exodus, brothers and sisters. Again, I will say it's always important for us to seek the counsel of the Lord in every situation. In these desert scenarios and situations where there be a famine in the land. These men of faith were each given different instructions based on the will of God during that particular season and that time. Scripture does not support that we are never to go to the world or participate in a world system for our livelihood. Isaac was given specific divine instructions not to go down to Egypt, not to go to the world system for safety in a time of famine. But Jacob, on the other hand, was given divine instructions to go into Egypt because it was the will of God at that time for a specific divine purpose. We see, brothers and sisters, that God can bless and protect and keep his people in whatever scenario that God calls his people to. These situations that have been revealed to us in scripture concerning Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they are personal. It is God being in a relationship with individuals and families, Abraham and his wife. Sarah, Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, Jacob, and now his family, his 12 sons and their wives and children, with Joseph already being in Egypt. And now when we get to the new nation of Israel in their exodus from the bondage and enslavement in Egypt, their desert experience, their wilderness journey, a journey of hope, or at least it should have been a hopeful journey because they were on their way to the promised land, the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a land described as flowing with milk and honey. 
and brothers and sisters in our own desert experiences, whatever they may be, whatever form they may take in this world, be it in our family, be it in our finances, be it in our businesses or in a our employment situation, our health, or with our children, our neighborhoods, or our communities. Because all of these things happened to the nation of Israel on their journey through the wilderness, through their desert, on their way to their promised land. And in some respects, brothers and sisters, as New Testament Christians, when we are born again, when we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God and we are now called children of God, we too are on our way to that promised land. We are on our way to heaven when we are sealed until the day of redemption. So no matter what happens to us in this world, be it a famine in the land, a famine or a desert type situation in our personal life or life situations, we are on our way to heaven to be redeemed in glory. And brothers and sisters, that's what the desert experience was for the nation of Israel. It begins in Exodus chapter 11, right before the last plague. God commanded Moses to tell the people to seek silver and gold jewelry from their neighbors, the Egyptians. In verse 2 of Exodus chapter 11, it says, Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So right here, brothers and sisters, when the nation of Israel left Egypt, they left with valuables. They left with worldly riches for their journey to their promised land, the land that God was giving them. So right here, brothers and sisters, we see that God has provided provisions for the people for their journey to their promised land. They had plenty of worldly wealth, silver and gold jewelry, valuable items to take with them to their promised land. In other words, they didn't leave empty handed. But what we will find out is that in the first few days of their journey through the desert and the wilderness, they begin to complain. And they started complaining because there were no trading posts or stores in the desert. There, were no, there was nowhere for them to spend or trade their worldly wealth in the desert. Their silver and gold that they had acquired in Egypt, some will say that that was their back pay, their wages for all of those years of slavery and uncompensated servitude in Egypt. But on their journey through the wilderness, on their way to the promised land, their worldly wealth, that jewelry, gold and silver were of no use in a desert land. In a land where all you want is water for yourself, your family and your animals. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, we learn that it was only three days into their journey through the wilderness, three days in their desert experience that the people began to grumble and complain because they could not find any water. In verse 22, it says, then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And 
he cried to the Lord and the Lord showed him a log and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. Right here, brothers and sisters, is a very important lesson. And I'll continue on. Verse 25. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. It's very important, brothers and sisters. There's a test that is occurring in our desert experience. Verse 26. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Right here, brothers and sisters. The Lord reveals a different facet of himself to his people. I am the Lord who heals you. That's another important lesson on our desert experience. We see a different revelation of our God. So here, brothers and sisters, after three days into their journey to the promised land, the people have just been freed from the slavery and oppression of Egypt, the world system, by the mighty hand of God, with many miracles, signs, and wonders. But after just three days into their journey, which should have been a hopeful journey, a journey to their promised land, they are complaining against Moses, their leader, which is in effect complaining against God. Because Moses was the man that was sent by God to lead the people. That's three days, brothers and sisters, complaining. And if we turn to the next chapter, Exodus 16, we get to a month and a half into their journey. And as it says in verse 1, they begin to complain about not having all of the food resources that they were accustomed to in Egypt. Verse 1 of Exodus 16. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in. And that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Brothers and sisters, right here in these first two incidents, three days in and then a little less than two months in, of the nations of Israel's desert experience, their journey to the promised land, even though it's crossing a wilderness environment, they are grumbling and complaining. They have a bad attitude. But what we also see is that God informs them that they are being tested, proven. And let's take a little time to look at what kind of tests are they going through. Verse 
if you have a piece of jewelry or some valuables, you often take them to a jeweler to perform a test on them to see what they are really worth. It may have been a gift given to you by a friend or a family member. And you take that valuable to a jeweler, gold or silver or some other jewelry, and you ask the jeweler to test it to see if it is real, to see what quality or what level of quality it is. If it's 10 karat gold, 14 karat gold, gold plated or even 18 karat gold. So the testing that God informs us and reveals to us in these two scriptures, sections, we can look at this testing as God proving or trying to discern the value of the nation of Israel. How valuable are they in concerns to their faith? And this same testing also occurred with Abraham because the same word used here in both of these incidents in Exodus chapter 15 verse 25 and in Exodus chapter 16 verse 4 the same word testing was told of Abraham when God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 verse 1 that I'm going to test Abraham in telling him to sacrifice his son Isaac. And brothers and sisters, we can look at this testing from God as approving. And that's what was happening to the nation of Israel at this time in their desert experience. It's what happened with Abraham. It's what happened in Isaac's life when a famine was coming across the land. We can look at these testing incidents, a proving incidents. And that's what the desert experience is in part. It's a test. And one perspective that we can have on a test because there are always two different perspectives. One perspective is that of the test taker, the one who has to take the test. And oftentimes we worry, we may dread taking a test, be it a scholastic exam or a medical test or a physical or even a drug test or an aptitude test for a workplace assignment. In most instances, we either want to pass or make a good grade, or we just don't want to fail the test. And in failing the test, we will not receive the benefit. We may not get the job, or we may lose our job, or we won't get into that school of our choice. Or we won't be able to be approved for a loan for that home or even in relationships. We may want a relationship to move to the next level. And if we fail the tests, maybe that relationship objective won't go as planned. So with everything depending on the results of a test, a good health report or a bad health report, whatever the test may determine about us, the person who has to take the test, we can oftentimes become worried. We can have fear. We can develop that sense to ourselves that we don't like to take tests. And brothers and sisters, that's one perspective. The perspective, the look from the position of the test taker. But now let's look at the other perspective the perspective and position of the one who gives the tests. And brothers and sisters, that brings us back to the jeweler or the one who is in possession of jewelry and wants to find out the value of that item that they have come into possession of. And in the perspective of the view or view of the owner or the jeweler, 
They take the items that are in their possession and test them to see what they are actually worth. And we can look at it from another scenario. Let's say an auto manufacturer who is looking to develop a new line or style of automobile. Maybe it's a whole new version of an automobile or maybe it's just a new part, maybe a suspension system, a new style of tires or motor. That auto manufacturer will run that new concept car or that new concept part through various tests to see what that vehicle or that part can do. In other words, brothers and sisters, it's a stress test. It's a performance test or even a values test. And these tests are open to whatever the owner or the possessor of that item wants to do in order to find out the value or the capabilities of what's in their possession. Before you buy a home, it's generally a requirement or even a best practice that you get that home or that property inspected, evaluated. So then you as a buyer, be it a home or a used car, you take that item and get it inspected by a professional so that you know exactly what you are potentially going to receive. You know exactly what that home or that piece of property is worth. And brothers and sisters, that's the perspective of the test giver. It's an inspection, an evaluation to see the value, to determine the performance level of the items that are in their possession. In professional sports, they have the combine, that's what they call it, where all of the new applicants, all of the new athletes who are desiring to become a member of a professional team, they go through the combine which is an inspection and a testing of their performance, abilities, aptitudes, and skills on the field of play. And brothers and sisters, that's what is happening in these instances, these desert experiences. God is determining who and what this now a nation of Israel is composed of. All of the people will get their individual ratings, as in the example of the jeweler. Once the jewelry, that valuable item, has been tested, the jeweler will now be able to determine if it's 18 karat gold, 14 karat gold, 10 karat gold, or even just gold plated jewelry. In this test of the jewelry, it reveals the level of purity, the quantity of pure gold and other less precious metals that make up the totality of that piece of jewelry. 18 karat gold has a higher content of pure gold than let's say 10 karat gold. And as you go lower, because 24 karat gold is considered pure gold. And especially when we start talking about to the third decimal point, if you happen to see a piece of gold or a gold coin with the stamp 999 on it, that means that the purity level of this gold is 99.99% gold. In other words, brothers and sisters, it's almost 100% gold. That's one of the highest purity levels that humankind can achieve based on scientific measurements and accuracy when it comes to gold. And sports teams, when they inspect and test players, they determine the value of that player for their team. Whether that player should be placed in the first string, second string, or third string, or even be sent down to a development team so that they can improve. So brothers and sisters, from the perspective of the test giver, 
the giving of a test or an evaluation to the nation of Israel, just like a test was given to Abraham and to Isaac and to even us today as New Testament Christians, we will go through a desert experience in this life. And brothers and sisters, it is a test. It is an evaluation of what we are truly worth at that time. God is evaluating us to see exactly what is inside of us. What exactly is God working with? And for the most part, brothers and sisters, this is like an entrance exam, a placement test. When you go to college, oftentimes, unless you have already prepared and taken college level courses in high school, most colleges will give you an entrance exam to see where they should place you on your journey towards a higher education goal. Brothers and sisters, it was it is estimated that around one million to a million and a half people left Egypt in the Exodus. Scripture says there were six hundred thousand, most likely men. So when you add up the women and children, you get a, around a million to a million and a half people leaving Egypt in the Exodus. So God is testing and evaluating the people from the perspective of the test giver to see exactly what the makeup of this million and a half people truly are. And I would say it's for the purposes of entering into and living as a society in the land that he is bringing them to, to the promised land, maybe to put them in different positions. Who's qualified for leadership? Who's qualified for this position, for government, for legislation, for running the church? So brothers and sisters, we have these two perspectives that help us better understand what God is doing and what is happening when we as born again Christians, oftentimes with the expectation as Christian that everything is going to be just fine. Everything is going to go great now that I am a Christian, a born again believers. And brothers and sisters, that's not necessarily the case. We are going to have to travel through some deserts in order to get to that promised land, to our heavenly abode. We are still living in this fallen and depraved world. So just waking up every day in the same house or in our same neighborhood after we have accepted Christ, brothers and sisters, just the environmental circumstances of this godless society, that can be our desert that we have to endure and travel through with our God by our side. And what did God learn about Abraham when he was tested? What did the test prove or reveal about Abraham? And the test of Abraham, when God said to sacrifice your son Isaac, the son you loved, that test produced evidence of, because Abraham, without hesitation, he got up early the next morning and started off on his journey to fulfill and obey the word of God. The test proved, as the Bible says about Abraham, that he was a man of great faith. We can say that the test of Abraham proved that he was 18 karat gold or higher when it comes to his faith toward God. Jesus as a man incarnate in the flesh was 100% pure gold. When it came to faith, he was 24 karat 100%. And each of us, brothers and sisters, after we go through the initial testing and proving, we will get our baseline level of faith, that mustard seed of faith. And over time, that mustard seed of faith that we initially receive, that baseline measurement, it should grow and mature.
So brothers and sisters, while some of us may start off as gold plated, if we remove the impurities and those less precious things that are a part of ourselves, according to the word of God and brothers and sisters, that's called sanctification. Brothers and sisters, we can improve on the level of faith that operates within us. So rather than being a gold plated Christian, just a Christian in name only on the surface, we can become, we can grow to be a Christian with faith deeply embedded in our hearts and minds and operating and bearing fruit that is 30 fold, 60 fold, or even 100 fold according to our faith. Now, brothers and sisters, let's revisit the pop quiz that God gave his nation just three days into their journey into the wilderness at the waters of Mara. And brothers and sisters, we should always remember that our journey, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it has a destination and that's eternal life and glory in our heavenly home and the new heavens and the new earth. So when we think about or meditate upon the desert experiences that may be occurring in our life or that will soon be occurring in our lives, the persecutions, the troubles and the tribulations, we should always put them together with the fact that we are a child of God and that God has already set in stone our divine and heavenly destination. Brothers and sisters, that can never be taken away from us once we are truly a born again Christian. We will always make it to heaven in glory. So while we are going through troubles and tribulations in this world, the fact that we have a guaranteed destination by the Lord Jesus Christ and that God is going to bring us to that destination. We are not going to get there by our own human effort, but it is by God's divine providence that we will surely reach our heavenly home. That brothers and sisters right there should make us happy. And we are going to see an example of this as we explore those bitter waters of Mara. And it occurred in Exodus chapter 15. Again, it was only three days after they had crossed the Red Sea. It was only three days after they threw a spontaneous party, singing and celebrating because God had delivered them from the slavery and oppression of Egypt. That symbol of godless world power. And then God destroyed Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. When they got on the other side of the Red Sea, they started partying and worshiping God spontaneously. But just a mere three days later, in that hot and dry desert, they became thirsty. And they looked around and they could see no water. They could see no place where they could get water to drink. And God was leading them through that. And brothers and sisters, we have to get there because here's that pop quiz where God led them to a place for almost three days where they were thirsty and they could see no water. And when they finally found a place, the waters were bitter. The water was not fit for human beings to drink. That's the place where God had called them to. A bitter place. A place that was unfit for a human being to get nourishment, to get rest, to satisfy themselves. But brothers and sisters, that was a pop quiz. Because as we read in Genesis chapter 15, verse 25, it says, Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed Moses a piece of wood to place in that water to turn the bitter water sweet. 
And brothers and sisters, this pop quiz, God leading them to the bitter waters of Mara, that quiz revealed their natural heart. I would even say the lust of their eyes. They had a confidence while they were living in Egypt. Even though the land of Egypt was relatively dry and a desert environment, but while they were living in Egypt, they could always look up and see the Nile River. So no matter how hot and dry that environment in Egypt got to the people, they were being enslaved and oppressed. No matter how bad the slave masters of Egypt treated them, they never worried about being thirsty because now they could, they could see the river now. All they had to do was look up. I can see water. And even if I had to steal away in the middle of the night to get a drink, they would be comfortable. They would not necessarily grumble and complain about their basic physical needs being met. But as they were traveling through that desert environment, when they could see no water and they were growing thirsty day by day, they started to grumble and complain. Where is the Lord leading me? Why am I in this environment? And when they happened upon this possible oasis, when they arrived at the waters of Mara, after three days in that hot desert sun, they were really thirsty. And when they tried to drink the water, it was bitter. And they looked at Moses and said, why did you lead us to this place? This place of bitter waters. And brothers and sisters, we have to remember when we think about Abraham and the famine that came across the land and also in Isaac's desert experience in his own land, the land that God was giving him, the land that God had led them both to. And now to this nation of Israel, we have to remember that God controls the weather in the earth. So when a famine came across the land, when Abraham, as soon as he arrived and a famine came across the land and when Isaac was becoming a man, he's he's living with his family and another famine came across the land. Brothers and sisters, it was God. It was the divine hand of God that caused the famine to come across the land. God also controls the weather. And brothers and sisters, it was God, it was the Lord leading his people to a place where they would find bitter waters in their desert journey. So brothers and sisters, I call this a pop quiz. And it was an important pop quiz or even an intake assessment, that placement exam. Because what this quiz revealed was the hearts of men the hearts of God's people this nation of Israel can be so easily manipulated by the lusts of their eyes the Bible says that it was just three days into traveling in the desert they were surely thirsty and when they looked up after traveling for three days, when they saw, oh, that's an oasis, the palm trees and possibly water, some people probably begin to run. And brothers and sisters, that is how we often get introduced to our desert experience. A meaningful change happens in our lives. We may have accepted Christ, or maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a promotion. Maybe it's a new relationship. Maybe we move to a new city. Maybe it's a new church community. But then all of a sudden reality hits us. The Israelites, as they were traveling in the desert, and they were thinking to themselves at the third day, if we can only find water, we will be all right. 
And on that third day, when they looked up and saw the palm trees and could see the sparkling water, they ran toward the pools of water at Mara. But as they began to drink the water, they found out that it was bitter and unfit to drink. And now they are saying in their hearts, why did the Lord lead us to this place? They begin complaining to Moses. What did they say in Exodus chapter 16? That it was better for us in Egypt than to be out here in the desert following the Lord to a promised land. In Exodus 16 verse 3 they said it would be better if we had died in Egypt by the hand of the Lord than to be out here. Brothers and sisters, this grumbling and complaining by the people is an expression of their discontent and their dissatisfaction with their relationship with the Lord at this point. In both of these instances, the bitter waters of Mara and then a little later on, a couple of months, a month and a half into their journey, when they're complaining about what they're going to eat. And then they compare it to all of the choices they had in the world, in that godless world while they were living in Egypt. But the pop quiz, that quick test of the people's heart at the beginning of the journey, it shows their propensity to quickly change their mind on being faithful and in a relationship with God. As soon as a sign of trouble or turbulence comes up, a disappointment, the people are already ready to turn back to go to Egypt to the slavery and oppression and second class status as citizens in a godless world system. They're ready to give up on God three days in. We see that in the pop quiz at the bitter waters of Mara. That's what it reveals about the type of people God is working with, their attitude and their level of perseverance in the midst of the storm, in the midst of trouble and turbulence on their journey, which should have been a hopeful journey to a promised land. But then the other perspective of this testing at the bitter waters of Mara it reveals the nature of God. We see another facet of God, a glorious facet of God in this situation, in the middle of this desert, in the middle of what could be a disappointment. The people have a legitimate need. They need water in a desert. And when they are presented with the bitter waters of Mara that are unfit to drink, the Lord gives Moses the knowledge after he prays and seeks the counsel of the Lord to turn those bitter waters into sweet waters. And brothers and sisters, this is the same God that did this for Isaac in a famine. When he turned a famine in the land, in the land he had called Isaac to, the land he was giving to the family of Abraham, and now to this nation of Israel, when there was a famine in the region, God told Isaac to stay put, stay in the land. And Isaac stayed in the land and began reaping a hundredfold harvest from the seeds he planted. And brothers and sisters, that was all in line with the word of God that came to Isaac that told him to stay in the land. Don't worry about the famine. Just stay put. I will be with you and I will bless you in the midst of a famine. And brothers and sisters, if the nation of Israel had been paying attention, even though they were initially disappointed when they arrived at Marah because the waters were bitter, the word of the Lord came to Moses and those bitter waters were easily turned into sweet waters. And when we move on a month and a half into, into their journey, back to Exodus chapter 16, this is another test 
and it starts in verse six. It says, so Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Verse nine, then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Brothers and sisters, a month and a half, almost two months into their journey, the Israelites have been grumbling and complaining. The state of their emotions, their heart and their attitude and their minds. They were at the point that they were they wished they were back in Egypt as a slave. That's what they said earlier in verse three. But they didn't say it in a prayer. They didn't collectively say it out loud to Moses and Aaron who were leading them on this journey. This was the spirit and the attitude surrounding the conversations they were having amongst themselves in the recesses of their minds and their hearts. This was the attitude of the masses, grumbling and complaining, wishing they were back in Egypt. That's how bad their attitude was about their journey to the promised land. And in the verses we just read, verse 12, it says, the Lord has heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Brothers and sisters, that's some very important information. That the Lord knows the secret desires of our heart. And the Lord in hearing the grumbling and complaining of the Israelites, the Lord came through with a great and awesome blessing. That's when we start getting the manna that came down from heaven in the morning. And on that specific day, the Lord called quail to come in so that the nation of people could eat meat. So brothers and sisters, we see that the Lord hears our grumbling and complaining. The Lord hears the secret desires of our hearts as individuals and as a people as a whole. The Lord is aware of our attitude when we are down, when we are discontented. And in this case, the Lord responded in a reasonable manner to satisfy a reasonable request and desire from his people. So right here, the nature of our God is revealed in this desert experience. The people are grumbling to themselves. Their attitude is bad. We want meat. We used to eat meat in Egypt. Man, we, I wish we were back in Egypt. And then the Lord reveals that I hear you. I hear your attitude. I hear your thoughts. And even though the people had a bad attitude, which should have been on their hopeful journey to a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Brothers and sisters, we should never forget about our destination. While the, the journey may be rough, our destination is worth it. And what the people were grumbling about, was it reasonable? And when we think about what the Lord brought came through, 
with manna and quail. We have to consider a million and a half people traveling in a wilderness journey. Today, and even at that time in history, people and societies were fully aware of the challenges that came with traveling across desert or wilderness areas. Even military campaigns, when you have to move large groups of people to travel away from their home base, in a military situations, the commanders prepare rations and other foodstuffs that can easily sustain their troops throughout the journey. And in these traveling situations, you don't take your best food with you because the best foods that you can have will spoil. You do not necessarily eat the same types of food when you are traveling into unknown areas or unpopulated areas in a military campaign or even in a camping trip. If you're going away for three days or maybe a couple of weeks on a journey, you may take with you canned goods and granola bars, things that you can pack with you in your backpack or in other bags, and items you take with you, you make sure they do not perish or spoil. We call that roughing it. When you go camping or when you're in a military campaign, they have rations, MRE, meals ready to eat. You just mix them with water. That's what soldiers receive in the field when they are away from home. So brothers and sisters, we can look at this manna from heaven as it was glorious and nutritious. When we look at it in hindsight, we can see that the raining down of manna from heaven, that's something that we traditionally do when you are roughing it, when you are traveling or camping, or you are in a large campaign such as soldiers being in the field away from their home base. You do not eat a high level and quality of food when you are not at your home base or when you are traveling, roughing it in the wilderness. And brothers and sisters, we make a conscious decision before we leave to pack these more robust foodstuffs that will not spoil when we're going on a journey in the wilderness, when we're camping or in a military campaign scenario. So the provisions of the Lord in this situation, they are reasonable. The manna from heaven when we consider the circumstances of one million to a million and a half people traveling through a desert or wilderness environment. If we take a look at Abraham, he made the decision not to endure the famine, but to go down to Egypt to a godless world system where they had all of the food and water you could drink during the time of famine in the land. Now, that was not on the guidance of the Lord. And the Lord did not use this opportunity of Abraham being in Egypt to reveal all of the divine power of God in the same manner that we saw God providing for Isaac and that we see God providing for his people in the midst of this wilderness and desert. Manna raining down from heaven in Egypt if that would have occurred, brothers and sisters, that would have simply been a distraction. Something that could easily be ignored among all of the things that were occurring in the world system and the godless world system of Egypt. Being a light in the world, as Christ told us in the gospel, that as born again Christians, we are to be lights in this world, a guiding light for people to come to God. But if you're in the city of Las Vegas or New York at night with all of the lights of Las Vegas and New York City, these cities which are a symbol of the godless world system, you would have to think to yourselves, will anyone pay attention to the godly life, 
the moral life of an individual when they have all of that godless activity and all of those artificial lights in the cities of Las Vegas and New York and other places? Brothers and sisters, it will take great faith to perceive the shining light from an individual who is living a life of faith in the middle of what we call Sin City, Las Vegas, with all of its distractions and deceptions from the artificial lights and activities that are occurring in that city. And we can look at any city, not just Vegas or New York, any big city with their ambient lighting at night, it causes the stars in the sky to be dim and for many of them to go unseen due to the lights, the artificial light that is being broadcast out by the city's infrastructure. But if you go out into the country, when you get away from the big city and there is no ambient lighting around, when it really gets dark around you and you look up into the sky, oftentimes a person will be amazed by all of the stars they can see in the night sky. Stars and lights that were previously unnoticed and unable to be seen when you're in the big city because of the distractions and the artificial lights of the big city. And brothers and sisters, that's another important purpose of the desert experience. God brings you to a place where you can clearly see what he is doing in the earth without any distractions. And we often have to get away from the godless world system, the big city living and lifestyles in order to see what our God is doing on our behalf in this earth. And brothers and sisters, that bad attitude, the grumbling and complaining we see occurring in the nation of Israel, that attitude is not something that is consistent with a strong faith in God. And it's so easy for us to begin to complain and to get scared, to have fear, to be discontented when we're going through our desert experience. And I'm quite sure that Isaac was also a little worried about staying put in the land that he knew was experiencing a famine. He even drew close to the Philistines and camped it. Another godless society, not as big as Egypt, he drew close to them for security, for a peace of mind, hoping that he, by being close to others, he would have provisions in the time of famine. But as he was obedient to the word of God and he began to plant seed during that famine in the environment, and he, as he made up his mind, to follow the word of God in the midst of a famine, to stay put. And brothers and sisters, it will take some human effort. We have to be strong to face the challenges that come against us in the places that our God will lead us to. And as Isaac made up his mind to make the best of it during this bad situation, as he started to plant seed, he was likely only initially hoping, I hope some of these seeds come up just for a few. He probably didn't have the expectations of very much of a harvest. But the Bible says that he reaped a hundredfold, that he got a bumper crop from the seeds that he planted during a famine. And immediately thereafter, the Bible says that Isaac grew to be a very wealthy and powerful man in the region. And his wealth and power came based only on the blessing of the Lord that was over his life. A blessing that works in good times and also works in a famine situation. What Isaac was facing with a coming famine or already the famine has come, he's ready to run away from it. 
what Isaac was facing was a bitter situation, just like the bitter waters of Mara, bitter waters that were unfit to drink, that famine environment that he had to endure, it was unfit and unable to sustain a human being. And it was unfit and unable to let alone to plant seeds and reap a hundredfold harvest. You just don't do that when there is a famine coming across the land. So, brothers and sisters, that revelation of God, that blessing of God should have changed Isaac's attitude toward the challenges that he may face in this world. So just as Moses received the word of the Lord about the wood that can turn the bitter waters into sweet, the blessing of the Lord on Isaac's life, it turned a bitter situation, that famine in the land, where he was subject to worry, where he was subject to be afraid. And now the Lord commands him to stay and endure these harsh conditions, endure this famine and this desert experience. And when Isaac stays put, he now sees that the blessing of the Lord on his life, it turns a bitter situation into sweet water. And how sweet was that situation to Isaac? When other individuals are barely reaping a harvest during a famine, but he is now bringing in a hundredfold, he is bringing in enough of a harvest to be a blessing and to be a point of blessing for the others around him. Brothers and sisters, that's what God is doing. That is the blessing of Abraham. That you are to be blessed so that through you, all nations will be blessed. Brothers and sisters, we are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. So like I said, Isaac's attitude toward famines, his perspective, his human reasoning, it should have changed. Especially the next time he may experience a troubling or turbulent situation in his life. If another famine came across the land or if another trouble in another form came into his life. Because after his experience in Genesis chapter 26, we would think that Isaac would have grown and matured in his faith and knowledge of God. He experienced it. And just as the people, that nation of Israel, as they traveled through the wilderness, the tests, like I said, that pop quiz at the waters of Mara, that was the baseline score for the people. When they got to the bitter waters of Mara, they were disappointed. But the word of the Lord came to Moses and he learned how to turn the bitter waters and make them sweet and fit for human and animal consumption. Brothers and sisters, that was a lesson for the people, for the nation. And a reasonable person would expect the people to improve, to grow and mature at each stage where the Lord is revealing these divine acts in the earth to sustain them on their journey. But only a month and a half later, the people are still, many of them, they are still grumbling and complaining, having a bad attitude toward their journey to their promised land. And again, the Lord provides for them resources and sustenance to sustain them on their journey in this desert experience. But a month and a half into their journey, we only see a relatively small amount of growth and improvement, if any at all. They still have that bad attitude. They're still grumbling and complaining about their journey. So a month and a half in, and the Lord had performed other miracles. We only see a little to no growth in their faith and their God, their relationship with their God. And it gets down to this, brothers and sisters, you can't have a bad attitude 
if you have strong faith in God, if you really believe and have faith in what God can do in the midst of a famine or a desert situation, brothers and sisters, how can you have a bad attitude? How can you grumble and complain if you really have faith, if you really know what God can do and will do in a famine or desert situation? Brothers and sisters, we should not take light of the testing and the revealing of our God in these situations. While there are many other things that we can learn from these desert experiences and these desert scenarios that are given to us in Scripture, because the lives of these men that are recorded in scriptures and this nation, this community of people, the church, the nation of Israel, as a group of God's people living in community and living together, these tests and their experiences should not be taken lightly. Nor should the tests and the desert experiences that we go through in our lives, neither should they be taken lightly. Brothers and sisters, these are opportunities for us to grow and to cleanse ourselves, to sanctify ourselves, to remove all of those impure and less than precious elements that have grown and developed in our character from living in the world, from living in a godless world system and a godless culture. Brothers and sisters, the desert experiences and the desert situations that we go through in life as Christians, they are also a purification and a growth process. Just like a seed that is planted in the ground, before you see those green shoots come above the ground, what you can't see is the growth that is occurring on the ground with the roots going down deep into the soil and establishing a firm foundation. Brothers and sisters, those roots must go into the soil and be established before you see that green shoot coming up out of the ground. The roots must be given time to establish themselves in the ground. And brothers and sisters, if we don't begin to establish those roots during these valley and desert experiences, it's not going to bode well for us as the challenges coming against us increase in difficulty in the world. And the plan of God continues on, oftentimes without us, if we have not developed as expected and as reasonably expected. And brothers and sisters, that brings us to Numbers chapter 11. And what we find here is that it has been over two years in their journey. They had now received the covenant and the instructions to build the tabernacle at Mount Sinai. It was almost a year of their building the tents and all of the other elements for the tabernacle structure to begin offering sacrifices while they stayed in the region around Mount Sinai. So when we get to Numbers chapter 11, after being on their wilderness journey for over two years, we get to verse four of chapter 11 and it says, now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving and the people of Israel also wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Brothers and sisters, many of the people at this time were still grumbling and complaining, in fact, weeping. And it was all about not having meat to eat. That's the same complaint they had just a month and a half, two months into their journey. Now it is over two years. It's the same attitude and discontent and grumbling 
that they were expressing at the beginning of their journey. So at this point, brothers and sisters, we see that God has begun to remove the bad elements from his people. And in the first verse of Numbers chapter 11, it says, and the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Brothers and sisters, our desires, our fleshly human desires do not change. The, word, the ways of the world in which we grew up in, they are still going to be with us. Our habits, what we have become accustomed to. Just like the people were remembering how things were in Egypt, how be it they were slaves. They remember all of the different foods that they were able to eat in Egypt and they say didn't cost us anything. And they were actually glorifying what it seems to be the bottom of the barrel foodstuffs, fish. Fish were probably plentiful with the Nile River running through Egypt. But when we look at the other foods that they were glorifying, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions and garlic. Brothers and sisters, they did not say that they were eating steak and chicken and the best cuts of fruits and pomegranates and grapes. In most cases, brothers and sisters, as slaves and as the oppressed in Egypt, the despised people, second class citizens of Egypt, they were not getting the best food that Egypt could provide. But nevertheless, after a little over two years into their journey, they were still glorifying the pitiful resources that they had been getting in Egypt. It was selective memory. So while in their minds at this point in their journey, after walking with the Lord for two years, they are remembering a perverted and deceptive view of their life as slaves and being oppressed and as second class citizens in Egypt. They're saying to themselves, oh, things were wonderful in Egypt. But they had been crying out to the Lord for him to rescue them. They were crying out against the oppression and the slavery that they were experiencing in Egypt. Brothers and sisters, this is the warped and perverted state of being deceived by the world system. And we can only see the truth and break this stronghold of bondage that the world system has placed on our minds and our hearts when we compare it to the truth of what God is and can provide for us. They were on their way to a land flowing with milk and honey, to houses and communities and infrastructures and buildings that they did not build. This, brothers and sisters, shows that they are addicted in some form to the world system of Egypt, that allure of Egypt, a godless world system supposedly can provide all of the things that human beings want. Brothers and sisters, that's the deceptive and deceiving view of the world, a world system apart from God. We experienced it today. We think we can get everything solved by the world, the ways of the world. And that deceptive world view they were slaves in Egypt. They were oppressed in Egypt. They were eating onions and garlic, cucumbers, and they want to go back to that. That deception, that stronghold in their minds, it continued to fuel their discontent, grumbling and complaining against the work of God that was being performed in their lives. And at this point, the Lord sees, and this is from the perspective of the test giver, that there may be no redeeming value in many of these individuals. 
after over two years of guiding and sustaining these people in a wilderness journey, a journey that was to their promised land, a most glorious destination. This bad attitude of grumbling and complaining against the Lord, brothers and sisters, that is a clear sign that their faith that initial seed of faith that may have been planted in them, it is not taking root and it is not growing. And we, here we see brothers and sisters, and it starts occurring before we get to Numbers chapter 11. But we can see the clear contrast that they have not grown. They have not matured. They are not changing. Many of the people in this group are not maturing in their faith towards God. And if you have time, brothers and sisters, read through chapter, Numbers chapter 11. And as you meditate upon the desert experience in their journey, the journey of the Israelites, and the lack of growth and maturity that many are exhibiting at this point, it's been two years into their journey toward the promised land. But I will read this part in verse 33 of the chapter. The Lord did in fact provide them with meat to eat, but it was not a blessing to them. For many, it was a curse. Because in verse 33, it says, while the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. Therefore, the name of that place was called Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had the craving. Brothers and sisters, the desert experiences that we may encounter in this life, when we become Christians as born again believers, they are strategically placed along our journey of life to grow us, to mature our faith in God, and to reveal in a more robust fashion the hand of God working in the earth and working on our behalf as children of God in Jesus Christ. And our perspective on life, on a desert experience, should most definitely change as we are going through a desert experience. And when we hopefully make it out on the other side in glory. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 verse 11, he says this about his growth and maturity, his learning and his change of perspective as an apostle for a number of years. In verse 11, it says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. In verse 11, the Apostle Paul says he has learned to be content satiated at peace whatever the circumstances whether he is in need or if he has plenty and he goes on to say in verse 12 he learned the secret of being content and brothers and sisters learning the secret that word in Greek means to be initiated as if one who is initiated into a mystery and brothers and sisters, that's what the desert experience is. It is part of the initiation into the mystery. It is when we get the hands-on experience of God working on our behalf, being with us in some of the most troubling and desperate situations that we can experience in this world as human beings. And the Apostle Paul had to go through many troubling situations, beatings, persecutions, jail, being stoned to death, shipwrecked several times, whipped. 
The apostle Paul went through all of those things, but God was with him and brought him through all of those things and will even bring him through the experience of death to a glorious resurrection just as Christ was raised from the dead. And brothers and sisters, when we get to Numbers 11, out of over one million people that left Egypt in the Exodus, many of them did not learn the mysteries of being content in any circumstance that the Lord would bring them through or to. In verse 13, brothers and sisters, back in Philippians, it is the culmination of the wisdom that we can learn by going through the desert experiences and most importantly, learning what we are supposed to be learning through that journey. And that's what it says in verse 13 of Philippians chapter four. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Brothers and sisters, I can say it better then it is said in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And I'm going to add a little bit for emphasis sake. If God be for us, who? And I'm going to add or what? What circumstance? What challenge? What desert experience or famine or plague can be successful against us? Because brothers and sisters, it's not always a challenge against a who. It's also against a what. A famine coming across the land, a pandemic, a virus, a plague, the culture of this world, the godless culture, the pressure that we experience to conform to this godless and world culture to get ahead, to go down to Egypt, become a part of the world culture for safety, for provisions. Brothers and sisters, those are some of the things that can come against us. But if God be for us, who or what can come against us and be successful? Brothers and sisters, the answer to that is nothing. So we should have contentment. We should learn to be content in any scenario or circumstance, in any desert experience, famine, challenge, trouble, disaster, plague, no matter what the trouble form, what form the trouble may take. We should be content if we have been learning our lessons. And brothers and sisters, I pray that we are able to hear this word of the Lord. May this word of the Lord come into us and change our hearts and minds according to the will of God. May we learn and are fully initiated in the mystery of the glorious knowledge of being content in any circumstance or scenario or situation that the Lord brings us to. Because if the Lord has brought us there, Heavenly Father, we know that you will be with us and will bring us through in glory. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.